We continue our study in the book of Romans. We come today to chapter 12, a new chapter. Chapter 12 of Romans, I'll be reading the first two verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'd like to read the same text in the Amplified Version. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, as well as pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. In the 1800s, in a very poor district in Ireland, a clergyman asked the question, what is holiness? A poor Irish convert in dirty, tattered rags jumped up and said, please, your reverence, it's to be clean inside. And I think that young man grasped the effects of holiness. He described the outcome of a person who has been made holy. It's to be clean inside. That's the effects. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul teaches in our text, how to become clean inside. To be sure, Christ himself and his atoning death on the cross is the source of holiness. This is clearly outlined and defined in chapters 1 through 11 of Romans. But beginning in chapter 12, God describes the effects of holiness in the life of the Christian. And beginning at chapter 12, we find a very practical application, many applications of what the apostle enumerated and laid down for us doctrinally in the first 11 chapters. Now, Paul indicates in our text that there are three key ingredients to holiness. In verse 1, the first one is consecration, or a synonym for holiness. Secondly, verse 2a, separation. And thirdly, verse 2b, transformation. These are the three key effects inside the heart of the child of God of holiness. Holiness is not only a doctrine, it's the practical outworking of the lifestyle of sanctification, the lifestyle of holiness, as the Holy Spirit makes us more and more to be like Jesus Christ. And so I asked the question, which is the title of the message, whatever happened to holiness? This doctrine, this practice has almost disappeared from the evangelical landscape. I'm not talking about from the modernists and the liberal churches. I'm talking about from the conservative evangelical church landscape. Holiness is almost never mentioned or rarely taught or insisted upon as the lifestyle of the people of God. And so we find ourselves observing a church that is in decline morally, that is in free fall and declension from the biblical norm. Not from anything extraordinary, from any extraordinary place that we need to be, but from our reasonable, intelligent, biblical expectation. 
Doctrinally, the gospel has in many and even most places been stripped of those elements which ought to prepare the sinner to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Holiness is a byword. It seems to be in many places a doctrine that is long forgotten about. We've almost seen a generation pass by in the evangelical church where in most evangelical churches, holiness has not been taught in decades. You ask the average Christian in a church today, what is holiness? And you get all different kinds of answer, answers covering the spectrum from soup to nuts, from A to Z. The church in many ways has morphed into a country club or a coffee bar, placing emphasis on filling the building with warm bodies rather than on quality of lifestyle through the teaching, exposition, and application of God's Word as applied by the Holy Spirit, which is what transforms us and changes us and makes us holy. The holiness that Christ died for His people to be. He not only died for our salvation, our justification, our redemption, but He also died for our sanctification, our transformation to become like Him. And so the biblical model for holiness and the lifestyles of many professing Christians and churches are widening at a scary pace. Are you concerned about this? Does, do, do you discern this growing disparity between what many in church profess and what they live out? Does it bother you or cause you to, may I say this, even have a little bit of a burden because of the lack of holiness, we are of all people are to be holy. The world when observing the church should be smacked in the face first and foremost with the holiness of the church when they see us. And if you do have a burden about it, does it not cause you or lead you to begin travailing and groaning and crying within your hearts to God? for the purity and the holiness of the church. Well, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul expects that those who are of God will hear God's word and will begin to apply the doctrines of salvation and sanctification to themselves. And if we faithfully apply those doctrines to our lives, we will be a reflection of what Paul says we are to be in Romans chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2, he talks about holiness. In verses 3 through 8, he talks about the gifts God gives the church to edify one another, which should result in greater holiness of lifestyle. And then in verse 9 through the end of the chapter, he talks about the relationship that church members are to have with one another in love. In love. And so in the first place then, let's talk about holiness. God willing, next time we'll talk about the gifts, the spiritual gifts, and then after that, the relationship that we have with one another in the local church. In verse one, we find the principle of consecration, the principle of holiness. The apostle, if you look at verse one, says, first of all, I beseech you, or I beg you. Now this word beseech is an important word. It's often translated entreat or exhort, but it's the best word that expresses the tenderness and earnestness of entreaty. I beseech you. It's an entreaty, a humble entreaty, but it's a strong one. Nevertheless, it's tender. But the apostle's tone, as I said, him being tender, he's saying it in a very kind way, not harshly because he's appealing to them as a father. He's urging them as a pastor. I beseech you, I entreat you, I exhort you. Now he's going to apply chapters one to 11 and he comes at them right out from the shoe, begging them as a father and a pastor to listen, listen to him as he applies these great doctrines 
How do we live out these great doctrines of justification and redemption and so forth? He's going to explain and apply step by step how we do that. Now, consecration is a term for holiness because that's what he's talking about in verses 1 and 2. He's talking about you and me as professing Christians living holy lives. That's what we were called to do. We were called to reflect the divine to the world. We were called to reflect heaven, as it were, to the world. The world and its members can only see horizontally what is going on around them. They are so much in darkness and walking in darkness, not even a glimmer of heaven and its holiness and its doctrines and its purity breaks forth in their world of darkness to shake them up and wake them up that there's another life that God has called human beings to who are made in the image of God. It's a life of holiness to be like God. That's why he made us in the first place, to be just like him. To have union with the living God. But since the fall of Adam and Eve and their posterity into sin, men have, and women and boys and girls, have groped about wondering, why are we here? He says, next, I beseech you, therefore, a very important word. There are several therefores in the book of Romans. There are four of them, as a matter of fact, thus far. The first one is in 3.20, which is the therefore of condemnation, declaring that the whole world is guilty before God as sinners. The second one is in 5.1, which is the therefore of justification. Because man is a sinner, God has sent forth his son, and the sinner must possess the imputed righteousness of Christ, if he is to therefore make it to heaven. The third one is in Romans 8.1. The therefore of sanctification and assurance of our salvation. Because we're justified in 5 and 6. Verse, uh, chapter 8 applies that and says that the Holy Spirit affirms our justification. Causing us to cry out, Abba, Father giving us assurance of salvation. And now in 12.1, we have the therefore of holiness, which is the basis for the other relationships that Paul describes in chapter 12 and so forth and onward uh, to the end of the epistle. The therefore of holiness. Holiness is the springboard, it's the foundation upon which we are able in faithfulness to God and in obedience to his word to relate to believers and unbelievers in a godly and biblical way that will, that will show forth believers as salt of the earth. And so these, these therefore transitions transition the reader from the doctrinal to uh, the practical section of the book. This particular therefore in 12.1 brings us, transitions us from the doctrinal to the practical because God wants to show us the intimate connection between the doctrines in chapters 1 through 11 with holy living. Do you believe in that? Do you believe in holy living? The next word, brethren, I beseech you therefore, brethren, identifies the specific audience he is addressing himself to. Brethren, who are brethren? Well, they are fellow believers with the Apostle Paul, are they not? But he views his brethren as this conglomerate, this mixture of saved Gentiles and saved Jews that he just finished describing make up this one body in chapter 11 that have been saved by his mercies. And that's the next phrase in verse 1 concerning holiness, concerning consecration. We see that, <clears throat> that he's begging us based on the mercies of God. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now the mercies of God here refer not only to the infinite 
love and kindness and compassion of God, which makes God God, which makes him the savior of sinners. He came to you and me at one time when we were bouncing around in darkness, far from the knowledge of God, far from the hope of ever arriving at truth just randomly by ourselves. He came to us when we didn't deserve it, when we were out without hope and without God in the world, when we were as lost as lost can be, selfish, egotistical, self-centered, even nigh unto self-worship. And in his infinite love and kindness, he drew us to himself with cords of love. As Romans aptly reminds us in chapter 5 and, and in verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. And so he sent forth his Son in his great love to die for the most unlovable, most unworthy people in the world. And that is true. But in this context of chapter 12 and verse 11, these are the ama amazing mercies when he talks about beseeching us by the mercies of God. He's referring specifically to the mercies he described in the first 11 chapters. Based on the foreknowledge of God, based on the fact that he loved you before the foundation of the world, based on these great doctrines, the calling and election and justification and redemption and adoption and sanctification and glorification that he described so beautifully in the first 11 chapters. Based on the fact that he has freely given to you not only these doctrines, but the reality behind them. Based on his infinite love for you as a sinner, as an elect sinner, he drew you to himself. He called you. He loved you beforehand. He redeemed you. He justified you. He is sanctifying you and he will glorify you. Based on these mercies, which are, which are doctrines on fire in the lives of the people of God. He's begging you to apply these doctrines to your life because of these wonderful things he has done for you. As so beautifully defined by these doctrines in the scripture. And then he goes on to say that you present your bodies... Now, before we get to the important word present, I want to deal first with the word body, our body. Because many don't understand the word body here and what it represents. By bodies, some understand this to be our corporal nature only, our fleshly body only, our physical body. Now, it includes that, but... Often this word is used in the Bible for not only our physical bodies, but for the whole person. Everything else that we are besides our bodies. And there's a lot more to us than only our bodies, right? Amen. The word body here comes from the Greek word soma, meaning the body as a whole. And it's used in a very wide application in the Bible. It's used literally or figuratively for the whole person. For example, in Romans 6.13, just a few chapters earlier, turn there to Romans 6.13, where God says, and do not present your members, this word member is the same word as body in, in our text, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members, your body, Members, plural, the whole person. Present your members as instruments of, un, of instruments of righteousness through which the holiness of God can shine forth to the world. Not only through our bodies, but through our spirits, our attitude, our emotions, our intellect, our, our mind. He's referring to the whole body when he talks about <clears throat> present your bodies. 1 Corinthians 5, 3, for indeed... I as absent in body, but present in spirit. No one would say that Paul is referring only to his physical body in this text, 1 Corinthians 5.3. He's talking about his whole person. Same word used. 
Matthew 6, same word. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Notice that the body here in Matthew 6.22 includes its spiritual capacities, not only the flesh, but the lamp of the body is the eye. He's also referring to your body as that which contains this mysterious yet miraculous gift of discernment. In Romans 12, 4 and 5, he says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Same word, but he uses that word in the same way to explain a metaphor that there are many parts to the body of Christ. There's one body, but many members. Same thing is true with you and I. The flesh is only one part. There's different parts of us. There's the mind, the spirit, and so forth. So the word body in 12.1 doesn't mean our physical body only, but all our physical, spiritual, and mental elements, the entire person combined. In other words, he's saying, present your entire being. Present your entire life to God. And he's begging you based on this unspeakable gift that you and I will never be able to repay God for. His mercies and all these various doctrines that are represented in Romans 1 through 11. By giving you the reality behind those doctrines, on that basis he's saying that you and I are to present our bodies, our entire life to God. Present your body, but your mind, your will your thoughts, your ambitions, your priorities, your judgment, present your mental, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual faculties to God. Present all that you are to God. All that you own and possess, your everything, all your talents and skills, Everything you are and have, present them to God. This is the response of the renewed heart made holy by the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> G.C. Wells quotes on the renewing power of the Holy Spirit in presenting ourselves to God saying, you might as well attempt to stop an earthquake as to prevent the going forth of the spirit of holiness from a soul washed in the blood or a church refined by fire. The Holy Spirit in us is constantly working to present our entire person, including our physical body, but everything else as well, to the Lord. Now let's look at the word present. Present your bodies. The word present means Present once and for all. Now this gives us the, the through the Greek implications, uh, implication of its meaning. It gives us a, a deeper understanding of the word present. It's, it's an ongoing presentation, but it's also a once for all commitment kind of presentation. It requires a commitment of your life to the world. Present yourselves, your whole life. Make a commitment. Don't go back on it to the Lord. Just as a bride and groom in their wedding vows commit themselves to each other. Now, the husband and wife would not go back on that commitment as they please. So this, this presenting of yourself to the Lord is a once-for-all commitment that determines what you do with your lives, including your bodies. But to present means more also than a reluctant yielding of yourself to the Lord. It's a positive giving of yourself to the Lord, especially in light of the mercies of God in justification and calling and election and all the rest. It's a willing, positive, free giving of yourself to God based on love for Jesus Christ. Because you cannot go back on this commitment. And so to present means once and for all 
It's not a reluctant yielding. It's a pre presentation of yourself to God daily with joy and praise to him for saving you. You cannot go back to the old life as Ephesians 5.3 says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, mm. let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. If you're presenting yourself to God every day to live a life of holiness and consecration, this is, is not fitting for you to go back and fall into the bondage of such an immoral lifestyle. Before we trusted in Christ, we lived such a lifestyle for the sinful pleasures of the world and our own sinful purposes. But now we belong to Him and we're to live for His glory. We're to daily be presenting ourselves to Him, not presenting ourselves to the world. So we're to be chaste and pure for Him. As 1 Corinthians 6.13 says, Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. He will daily raise us up, giving us life-giving power to overcome the sinful temptations of the world as we present ourselves to Him to live holy lives. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, your marriage commitment to him when you were presented to him, your holy husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, which will be finally sealed at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're not, this is not a commitment, a presentation to just any ordinary person. You will be presented on that last day at that marriage supper, that feast, that reception, as the bride of Christ. And that's why Jeremiah reminds Israel in 3.14, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. He says the same thing in Hosea 2.19. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. The faithful presentation of ourselves to God, because God is indeed faithful to us. And so the body and everything connected with it that God has given to us, through which to serve him and bring glory to him, is God's temple. He owns it. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, let's turn there. 1 Corinthians 6.19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're depicted as slaves sold from a former slave owner to a new slave owner. We formerly were slaves of Satan and sin. Now we are slaves of God. And God paid a price to buy us from that old slave master. The price he paid was the death of his son, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore we are not our own. And we're to be glorifying God as we present ourselves daily to him to live holy lives. And therefore you cannot just do anything you want to do with your vessel. It's owned by God. You cannot use your eyes to look on anything that you want to. Many believers think they have the liberty to, within this saturated realm of entertainment that we live in, to look upon anything that they want to. God says, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. You can't use your ears to listen to anything you want. And you just can't use your time to do anything you want. Is it your time or is it God's time? You can't think about anything you want either. You say, what is God? Thought police? Well, I wouldn't put it that way, but yes, he owns your thoughts. He owns them. They're not supposed to be your thoughts. We're to think God's thoughts after him, right? You have the mind of Christ. Bring every thought, not just some thoughts, into the 
captivity of the obedience of Christ. Some of us are not deeply convicted enough about that because you will leave here and you will allow yourself as your own worst enemy to sit down and be taught by the world and its philosophies, by the things you hear and see, and have the world's thoughts be put into you, and that's wrong. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's wrong to have other thoughts that are legitimate. Thoughts we have to think because we work a job and some of us are in the process of learning and we learn other subjects than the Bible. We're not talking about that. I think everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about. And you can't even spend your money on anything you want because it's not your money. It's been given to you by God. You should spend it accordingly as a steward of all the resources he's given you because he's also given you the health to continue to be able to go out and earn that money. So every penny must be carefully looked at as you spend it. And you can't just go anywhere you want to go. All of these things are heavily regulated by the doctrines, by the doctrine of holiness. Did you hear that? Our thoughts, our eyes, what we look upon, what we hear, what we spend our time on, where we go, what we want to do, are heavily regulated by the doctrine of holiness because this doctrine comes at us, including the doctrine that Walter read in Hebrews 12. It comes and it goes deeply into the very minutia of what we are allowed to see and listen to and watch and view and think about. It gets down into the very core of our being. You say, well, you're being legalistic. No, I'm not. I just read or quoted a verse, bring every thought into the obedience of the captivity of Christ. God says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. The spirit of holiness placed within us by God's spirit delights to think about and dwell upon and meditate on the word of God and the things of God. He put these things within us. His spirit, his word, as we are reminded in Hebrews 8.10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, referring to the new covenant. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And his law implanted within us often is in conflict with the very things that we inculcate and we assimilate by what we look upon and listen to and spend time with in the world. God says, listen to me, you who know righteousness in Isaiah 51, you people in whose heart is my law. Listen to me, he's saying. Again, in Psalm 1-2, he describes the character of holiness, the desire of a, of, a, of a true believer to be consecrated to God, who is described as someone whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Right? Someone who responds, as Isaiah 48 says, to God, oh, I delight to do your will, O God, and your law is within my heart. When we're walking in holiness, tell me that this doesn't express beautifully how you feel, as in Psalm 1972. The law of God or the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Holiness is not an option, as some false teachings suggest, such as easy believism. And the idea that Christ can be your Savior, but not the Lord of your life. There is no such separation between justification and sanctification. And all of its connected doctrines, when you look at the true Christian from beginning to end, from before the foundation of the world, when we were foreknown and elected by God the Father all the way through until our glorification. We see someone who is being created and incrementally transformed into the perfect image of Christ. Therefore, I'm not going to separate any of these doctrines which reflect the totality of our creation and transformation with the goal of becoming like Jesus for we will see him and know him as he is from one another. God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, out of concern, that his people would be holy 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? Is the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our tired, sleepy souls? He says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he, who, he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. There is no such gospel of justification that is separated from sanctification. Philippians 1.20 says, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And so we must yield the members of the body as instruments of righteousness. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, Romans 6.13 says, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. Living sacrifices? And your members as instruments of Righteousness to God. And that's what he says in the next set statement. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. In other words, you and I are to be an, a living offering, not a dead offering. Now this, this idea of living sacrifice is a metaphor that is intentionally drawn from the Old Testament. It's Old Testament imagery, and Paul loves to use the types and figures that are implanted in the Old Testament, which Christ fulfilled himself in many ways, and also the people of God fulfill in themselves. So in the Old Testament Levitical sacrificial system, we had a whole industry of the killing of sacrifices. A tribe of 22,000 priests and Levites were dedicated to the killing of these sacrifices. Now the sacrifice needed to be, or the sacrifice, the animal sacrifice needed to be pure. If any of them were lame or torn or sick, partially dead or even dead, they were unacceptable sacrifices. Now when the Israelite brought the sacrifice to the priest. The sacrifice was alive, but the priest would kill it and spill the blood on the basin underneath the altar. But the sacrifice was usually brought to the Lord alive and pure and unblemished. And the priest would inspect the sacrifice to make sure it conformed to the Levitical principles and, and maxims. And any of these sacrifices that were less than uh, conforming to the biblical pattern were forbidden to be offered. How many Christians, by way of application, offer to God sacrifices as they worship the Lord corporately and privately that are less than pure? less than heartfelt, less than full of faith. How many? How many Christians go to worship services selfishly, with unrepentant sin, playing church? And God looks at their worship and it's unacceptable. We're to offer, as the text says, acceptable sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm which the text says is pleasing to God. So how was your worship today? Can I say that in love? Did you prepare yourself before you came to church? Or were you running late and you just whoosh, finished watching TV and just whoosh, flew into church, flew into church? And we wonder why we're falling asleep. And work tomorrow is on our minds. And we're not trembling underneath the word of God. 
But also the Bible says the Old Testament sacrifices were to be holy. That's what our text says. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's the next word? Holy. Drawing on Old Testament imagery. Those Old Testament sacrifices, in other words, offered by the, the tribe of priests were types and figures of believers in the new covenant who were to be living sacrifices through holy living, holy living, where the life of Christ by the power of holy, the Holy Spirit is always renewing us as living sacrifices. In one sense, we're dead. But in another sense, we're living sacrifices. We're dead to what? To ourselves, our will, our life. Because we're not our own. We are therefore a dead sacrifice in terms of being dead to ourselves and our will. So that we might be a living sacrifice to the Lord. But the Old Testament sacrifices were to be holy. They were not to be polluted by any known sin. God forbid that anyone at Christ Bible Church would come in here and attempt to worship God with unconfessed sin, without, the, without carefully repenting of sin and being cleansed afresh by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament sacrifices were to be holy. They were to be wholly devoted and consecrated to God. And therefore, the lamb or bullock offered under the law must be without blemish and disease or defect. This is a picture of repentance before worship. When we come to God, first repenting, and then being cleansed by the blood of Christ, and then we, re we offer an, our praise and our worship and thanksgiving, and then we present ourselves to God as true worshipers in spirit and in truth. God accepts our worship because it is being offered through the atoning and sanctifying sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our high priest prays for us as imperfect worshipers whose motives are not always the best. We are often weak, but as we come, even with mustard seed faith and repent based on God's promise, if you confess your sin, I am faithful, he says, and just to forgive you of sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And when he cleanses us of the sin, he leaves behind him a clear conscience. And the grace and joy of entering his courts with praise based on this humble sense of, of the fact that, that God forgave me an unworthy sinner. Even though I'm a saint now, yet he forgave me of my sin. And here I am once again finding myself in need of cleansing and purification as I approach his courts in worship. And what did he do? The blood of Christ cleansed me afresh. And the Holy Spirit affirmed that cleansing by renewing my joy and my love for him. <laughs> this is a wonderful process because my works and my attempts at, at pleasing God are completely separated from it. I just come to Jesus Christ and I cast myself down at his feet, weeping over myself and my weakness and my sinfulness, but looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, the alpha and the omega of my faith, who will always lift me up and present me to the Lord after he cleanses me. So the offering, such as the lamb or the bullock, has got to be without blemish, disease, or defect. As the Lord says in Exodus 12, 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. But the sacrifice, as we read in our text, verse 1, must also be acceptable to God. We should, we should be concerned as to whether or not our worship should be acceptable to Him. We should not enter the worship of God with a frivolous spirit, a shallow attitude, where we're really not concerned about what we're doing or paying attention to what we're doing among the assembly of the saints as we worship Him. God is very concerned what we're doing in here. He's very concerned where our minds are. We have 167 hours during the week to think about the world and the things of the world. 
which we really don't want to and like to all the time, but this hour is an hour in which everything needs to be conformed to the mind of Christ. Of course, all 168 hours of the week are to be conformed, but we ought to take pains to prepare for worship. Why do you think I'm always encouraging and exhorting the church through emails and texts and sermons and all the rest to come into the house of God ready to worship Him, hitting the ground running with this fresh spiritual concentration and intensity of spirit that the Holy Spirit provides for us to be able to block out the world and the cares of the world and everything I have to do tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. Don't worry about tomorrow. You and I may not even be here tomorrow. All I have is now. And I'm to value as very precious this hour and a half when the saints come together. It's a mysterious time where, in a sense, individually we worship God, but if we have the mind of the Spirit, we're enabled to join heart to heart with other spiritually minded worshipers to join and render to Him the communal praise which He has ordained before the foundation of the world. So it's got to be acceptable. We ought to be concerned as members of Christ Bible Church. Before we enter the house of God, oh God, I'm concerned that my worship and the worship of my brethren along with me is acceptable to you. I'm concerned about that, Lord, but I know you've given us your son. Who, if he can bring the myriads of indefinable, innumerable saints to the Father at the end of time, every saint... When the last Gentile is saved and the last Jew is saved and he takes all of the trillions and trillions of saints who have been perfected, who are now glorified, who are now standing before him to, to engage in this eternal worship service. He, the Lord Jesus Christ is able to simultaneously make all of the combined trillions of the saints and their worship not only acceptable to the Father, but pleasing in His sight. The Father will have a response, a pleasing response to us as the body of Christ. If He could do that for the innumerable company of the saints as our high priest, cleaning up in our worship what is lacking because of the weakness of our flesh, what can He do with about a hundred people here at Christ Bible Church? Right? This is our, our most important ministry. That our worship would be so edifying, so invigorating, so joyous to not only ourselves because of the presence and equipping grace of God, but to the Lord himself. That's what we should be praying about at our prayer meeting. And I, I want to commend the church today. We have 15 people at the prayer meeting. The largest number in about three months. Keep it up. Those of you who are thinking and, and considering coming to the prayer meeting, wondering, you know, one of these days I'm going to show up at the prayer meeting. Well, keep thinking about it. Keep praying about it. Because it was a glorious time in prayer today and in worship. But remember about this idea of sacrifice. This idea of sacrifice yeah. is to be acceptable. Now, the Greek word acceptable, very important again in our text in verse 1. It describes the condition of our worship. Our worship is to be acceptable, and therefore we have to fulfill the conditions on our part to make that worship acceptable. And what's the condition? Well, the work has already been done by the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, there's only one condition, and even the condition itself, is the fulfillment of which is an act of grace. We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse, purify, and equip us to make our worship acceptable. But the worship has to be acceptable. In the Greek, it means pleasing or well-pleasing. Our worship is acceptable to the Lord through Christ and it becomes pleasing to God. Can you imagine that here is a bunch of weak, saved people. We can do something in this world that pleases the Father. 
that is well-pleasing to the Father. <laughs> Coming into his house. Ready to break out in a trot and a run to worship him. By the power of the Holy Spirit, cleansed afresh in the blood of the Lamb. And the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts, being freshly sanctified, are pleasing to him. They're well-pleasing. Whenever I, I sense by faith that that is taking place in my life, immediately the thought comes to my mind, my life is fulfilled. If I can do something that is pleasing to the Lord. And the saints are to be pleasing God in this way regularly. And when we scan and survey the New Testament, we find that the lives of the saints, as they live holy lives, as they worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, not only corporately, gathered together, but through holy living, they are constantly pleasing God. Philippians 4, 18 and 19 says, Paul says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Colossians 3, 20. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. It's the same verb. Mm. Hebrews 11.5, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch pleased God. His life of holiness consistently pleased God. Was he perfect? No. Are we perfect? No. But we can live lives well-pleasing to God. Holy lives. Hebrews 13, 21. That God would make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. That last part is the key through Jesus Christ. By faith in Jesus Christ as believers, God will and can work in us the works and the actions, the thoughts and the words that are well pleasing in his sight. An acceptable lifestyle of holiness. But these acceptable sacrifices, the scripture defines as living sacrifices. Let me give an example of two living sacrifices in the Bible which will help us understand what this term living sacrifices mean. The first one was Isaac in Genesis 22. You don't have to turn there. But you'll remember that Isaac willingly put himself on the altar and would have died in obedience to God's will. But the Lord sent in a, a ram to take his place. But Isaac died just the same. How did he die anyway? He died to his will. Isaac died to his own will. But then he still lived, right? The same is true with us. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. We die to our will, but we still live. When he got off that altar, Isaac was a living sacrifice to the glory of God. Of course, the second one is the most preeminent, which is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Not only is our Lord Jesus Christ the perfect illustration of a living sacrifice. But he also died as a sacrifice in obedience to the Father's will. But he rose again and became a living, living sacrifice. So let me give you, just jot these down quickly, a few things in order for us to be well-pleasing to God living holy lives. As I wind this message down. To be a living sacrifice, our worship must and our, uh, be required by God. We must offer to him what is required by him, not anything we want to be a living sacrifice. Israel tried to just offer anything at any time, and God rejected it. And he said of the Israelites in Isaiah 1 concerning their worship, concerning what they presented to him, concerning what they offered to him. He says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, 
Who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil from your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you do refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What is he describing? He's describing that God requires a certain kind of sacrifice. And you and I are given the instructions and the blueprint of exactly what type and kind of sacrifice we're to offer. And we need to follow that closely. Now, I'm not going to go into detail in the, uh, about this passage, but in it, God rebukes Israel to the, almost the highest possible way he can rebuke them. And the description in this text describes every form and kind of worship that they can offer to God corporately in fulfillment of the Levitical requirements, including the feast days, the Sabbaths, the kind of prayers and their thoughts and their animal sacrifices, the, the new moons, the calling of assemblies. God considers it all iniquity. His soul hates it. He cannot stand in hearing their words. Why? Because their hearts were far from God. They were not cleansed by the blood of Messiah Jesus Christ, by faith in Him. This is a great lesson to us. We must offer to God the worship as living sacrifices that is required by God. And this is, on our part, concerning human responsibility, it's hard work, even though the effectiveness of it, the effective element of our worship is is done by our Lord Jesus, has been done by his death on the cross, and we obtain grace by faith in him. But we have a job to do. And God says he works through it. He will minister his grace to us through that, through that hard work. Not because of anything we're doing, but because of his grace. That may seem contradictory, but he does command us to prepare our hearts for worship, to repent of our sin, to trust in Him to come uh, into our presence during worship. As we read in 1 Peter 2, 4 and following, coming to Him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to take this description and command seriously. But also, it must be offered up in love, secondly. When you come to the Lord, living your life as a child of God in holiness or in public worship or private worship, you're to, you're to do so from the standpoint of love. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ compels us. Mm -hmm. Also, our worship and our offering up of sacrifices, our holy lives are to be offered up to God in holy fear or holy reverence. We read about Nadab and Abihu, for example, and their relationship to the corporate assembly. And Nadab and Abihu, Numbers 3, 4, died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. 
and they had no children. And Eleazar and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron, their father. We can't be coming in here or even privately worshiping and offering to God strange fire. That worship which he has not required. He wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. We need to have a holy fear when we approach the Lord. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 5. Walk prudently when you go into the house of God. And draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what they do. That they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. Be careful about the way you approach worship. I'm not saying we should approach the Lord and worship with this morbid, weighed down sense of, of negativity. And Oh, there's a combination of joy and humility in worship. Mm -hmm. But when we come forthly, our worship must be offered in living faith as living sacrifices, offering up worship that is acceptable to him. He says without faith it's impossible to please him. He also says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2, For the, indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. As you prepare for worship during the week, you maintain a lifestyle of meditating upon the Word of God, imbibing the Word of God, reading it, meditating upon it, especially as you lead up to the Lord's Day in worship, and you do everything you can to increase and rejuvenate your faith, because when you hear the Word of God preached and taught, when you gather together as a church, the word that is taught and the spiritual activities that are conducted, whether it be prayer, worship, preaching, teaching, will all be rekindled and quickened and increased. And you will profit greatly because your faith has been growing and kept alive during the week by reading the word of God and by walking with the Lord. And your faith will be expecting on the Lord's day, the Lord to speak to your heart. Number five, it must be offered with a just sense of one's own unworthiness. Our spiritual sacrifices must be offered to God with a just sense of our own unworthiness. And this is what I'm talking about. There is this humility, this humble approach to God, but there's also joy in the presence of the Lord. But we need to be careful because if there's any humility in approaching God, this is not necessarily bad. God says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Spurgeon said, I scarcely like this word sacrifice because it involves nothing more than a reasonable service. If we gave up all we had and became beggars for Christ, it would display no such chivalrous spirit or magnanimous conduct after all. We would be gainers by the surrender. Let me quickly mention our second point, which should not take long, separation. There's consecration or holiness. Secondly, separation. Verse 2a, and do not be conformed to this world. The meaning of the word conform here, to, and again, a very choice word, is to shape, to shape another to our form. The fashioning of oneself according to another pattern. And that's what happens when we become conformed to the world. We take the shape and fashion and form of the world. And God says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't take the shape of the world. You're a new creature in Christ. Don't be conformed, in other words, to the corrupt principles, philosophies, customs, and practices of the world. You need to be separate, completely separate from the world. As God told the believers 
uh, in the letter to James, chapter 4, verse 4 and following, adulterers and adulteresses. This is what happens when we become conformed to the world. We commit adultery, spiritual adultery. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? When we get too close to the world, the spirit of God within us, who is the down payment on the purchased possession that God purchased by the blood of his son, the spirit of God, when we get too close to the world, yearns jealously with groanings. Sometimes that are palpable, convicting. Don't get too close to that. You're not your own. You're the Lord's. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Oh, what a word for the church in our culture. Boy, that's easy to read from the Bible, is it not? But how powerful and how appropriate is the application of that to our American culture? Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. It seems to me that almost every single secular industry and institution is designed and geared to stir up worldliness and attractiveness to the things of the world. Technology is, is, is almost annually, almost monthly, almost daily taken to a new level to make the world irresistibly attractive from what it was just a week before. And being indifferent to this, to this increasing seductive attractiveness to the world is not going to make you stronger to resist such an attraction. You've got to take deliberate efforts to separate yourself from all the world and the things of the world. I'm not talking about sell everything you have and go live like a monk in some cave in Afghanistan. We have to live in the world, but we don't have to live like the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Paul is saying that the doctrines that he taught in chapters 1 through 11 are doctrines which should cause us, if we have the Spirit of God within us, to not be conformed to this world. If you are redeemed, if you are justified, if you're an adopted son or daughter of God, the Spirit of God within you will affirm that you and I are not to be conformed to this world. And that's what he says in 2 Corinthians 6. I want you to turn with me and then we'll move on quickly to our last point. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Everybody who has a Bible, please turn there. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. And if you don't have a Bible, please bring it next week. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I have uh, had to counsel single people who had a clandestine secret affection for an unsaved person that they knew it was wrong to have such an idolatrous affection. And we would talk and they would say, Pastor Joe, I know this is wrong. And it's a struggle. Unconverted women and unconverted men dress in such a way, talk in such a way, and seduce us in such a way as to have us spoil our purity and holy lifestyle before the Lord. Daily we must repent and make a break from them in our hearts, which is sometimes not easy to do. Amen? Even some married people struggle with this. No. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch. 
Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, now watch, what is our response? If the filthiness and the wickedness and, and the conformity of the Lord has begun to grow within us again. God says in, in um, uh, chapter 7 verse 1, Therefore having these promises that He will be our Father, He will protect us, He will help us. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Mm. Holiness! Holiness, the constant perfecting and growth and maturing of holiness within us so that we cannot be conformed to the world, be separated from the world, and be conformed to Christ. Spurgeon says, listen, and this is my burden for Christ Bible Church. Nothing worse can happen to a church than to be conformed to this world. And in our culture in America in 2014, even much more than his culture, we have temptations and struggles with worldliness that he could not even imagine in 1870 or 1880 or 1860. The job of a pastor today, bringing the people of God week by week back into the depths of the teachings and principles both doctrinally and practically of the Word of God, for all of us to be re-immersed into the mind of Christ, being freshly sensitized to all that God hates about sin and all that God loves about righteousness is, is a humongous task. It's a daunting task, one that requires courage on our part. One that requires an appetite on the part of the people of God for such a ministry, an expository ministry, a teaching ministry that will cause you to run the gamut in being searched out before God and freshly restored to fellowship with Him by the Word of God. Not only a milk ministry, but a meat ministry of the Word of God so that everyone gets their portion and is able to be fed and repent, and freshly consecrate their lives to Jesus Christ. Now very quickly, number three, 2B, transformation. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, I love this word transform in the Greek. The implications are so juicy and powerful. Vine's dictionary renders the meaning of transform to change into another form, to undergo a complete change, which under the power of God will find expression in character and conduct. It's not just a change in word only, but when we experience that morphing, that morphing, that, that metamorphosis coming from the Greek word, Metanoio, where we get the English word metamorphosis. It means a change. And as believers, we've gone through one change when we became born again. But in an ongoing way, we change daily in conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. This word tra tra uh, transform is the same word as transfigure. In Matthew 17, 2, when it talks about Christ being transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. It's the Greek word metamorpho, like I said, where we get our English word metamorphosis. It means to change, to transfigure, to transform, specifically a change within. The world wants to change your mind. The world is not indifferent about you. You may think it is. The Bible says the world hates you if you're a believer. It wants to change your mind. It wants to expose your weakness. It wants to embarrass you and find fault with you in the eyes of other people. So they can try to prove you wrong. So it exerts pressure on you from the outside. But the power of the Holy Spirit 
changes and transfigures our minds and spirits by releasing power from within, the power of the Holy Spirit. If the world controls your thinking, you're a conformer. If God controls your thinking, you're being transformed. Which is it with you? We find the same word in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Metamorpho. From glory to glory. You're going through a metamorphosis constantly. By the Spirit of the Lord. And how does He do it? How does He change you? Well, it's by the renewing of your mind. <clears throat> by the renewing of your mind. That's what the Holy Spirit is constantly striving to accomplish within us. When our minds are renewed, it's not talking about intellectually, talking about the spiritual man, the spiritual mind, daily transplanting the mind of Christ. And when this happens, it's like getting a transplant of a fresh, holy brain so we can think like Christ. God wants us to think like Christ. And it's the function of the Holy Spirit to stimulate us and prompt us to think like Christ. John says, he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And we can think like Christ by the renewing of our minds. Why else would God describe the way the spiritually minded thinks when he says we have the mind of Christ? When he tells us in Ephesians 4, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, put on the new man. He takes away the worldly mind. He decimates and evaporates and destroys the worldly mind, the, the compromising, lukewarm mind, the mind that has had Seeds of sin taken a foothold. When we repent and trust in Christ for cleansing by his blood, the Holy Spirit transforms our mind. He renews our mind. As we spend time meditating on the word and memorizing it and making it a part of our inner man. God will gradually make your mind more spiritual. And this is beautifully described in, in many passages of scripture. I'll not quote them because of lack of time. So that if we're renewed by the Spirit, we will in the end, which the end of verse 2 says, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you are renewed by the Spirit of God, the will of God for your life will be affirmed and proven in your conscience and in your heart. The Spirit automatically will guide you with His thought, His mind, to be in His perfect will and to know that the words of your mouth, your worship, your lifestyle is acceptable and pleasing in His sight. So, in closing, have you presented your life as a living sacrifice to God? Have you done that recently? Are you being transformed and renewed into His image? I hope so. Whatever you lack, go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk to him about it. Tell him about it. He's listening. He always lives to make intercession for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the once for all sacrifice for sin and for uncleanness that we might be the ongoing living sacrifices that reflect your holiness to a world that is unholy. Oh, make us holy. Oh, transform us. Oh, renew us, Lord. We need you to do this for us. And we thank you that through the cross work of our Savior and by faith in him, he will continue to transform us into that beautiful image of our Savior and his glorious character and being. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.